Hey folks, it's Dr. Christine Sauer here, and I'm really excited to uh, see you today at uh, another of my favorite events because I love to teach. I come from an old teacher's family, and I've been always told I talk too much. So that's my opportunity to confer everything I learned in my life. And you'll learn a little bit about me, a little bit about brain health and mental health and gut health and how the gut and the brain and the weight goes together. Because most of you know by now that I myself lost 150 pounds at some point and kept it off now for about 16 years. And that was no easy feat, I tell you. And I know everyone who struggles now with weight loss, it is possible, you can do it. It takes tenacity, it takes time, it takes habit change, but you can do it. Okay, let's get started. Um, today, we are talking and I have a little presentation. I love colorful pictures. Uh, we will talk about nine ways to train your brain. Oops, what did I do? I'm not perfect, sadly. Uh, I wish I was. It doesn't work. Uh, uh, nine ways to train your brain to lose weight and possibly fast if you can. Now, what we'll be talking about today is number one, why do we really need to care about brain health when it comes to weight? What does it have to do with each other? And I would explain the three dimensions of brain health, but really it's five. <laughs> and then leading to the three main causes of the diseases of our time and obesity being overweight is one of them. Because you might remember that 500 years ago, only rich people were obese. <laughs> and then we'll talk about nine ways to train your brain to lose weight fast. It will be about an hour or a little bit less. And I'm happy for everybody that's here live. Please uh, feel free anytime during the event to uh, um, type a question in the chat. I'll answer them after I'm finished with the teaching. And everybody that couldn't be here, I'm happy that you are now watching the recording of the event and uh, hopefully you'll take something away from it that is valuable to your journey to life and through weight loss, lasting brain-driven weight loss, my favorite topic. All right, so first let's get right started. Why really do we need to care about brain health at all? What's the brain have to do with being overweight? Isn't it all just diet and exercise? Well, not really because success in anything we do starts with an optimized brain. Let me explain. Think about our government. Brains run the world. We are the governors of our life in a way. We decide, we make the decision. We think we make the decision, but it's really our brain and our, if our brain doesn't function well, says my mentor, Dr. Daniel Amen. You might have seen his famous book, Change Your Life, Change Your, change your Brain, Change Your Life. It's amazing, by the way. Brains also run the stock market. Whether you succeed or not, it's determined by your brain. And most people don't realize that your brain actually makes a decision for you 15 milliseconds before you are consciously aware that you even made a decision. Hmm. Now, of course, brains also run markets. And they run the choices that we make when it comes to food. That's why the training of brain is important. Brains also run our families. Whether we get along with the partner, whether we even choose the right partner, whether we have friends or family, whether we get along with our children, depends on the health of our brain. And of course, <laughs> there's my pictures of before and after. Our brain and body are important. Our brain determines whether we are able to lose weight in the first place, but then more importantly, whether we can end the yo-yo dieting, stop that nasty cycle that we try, try, try and fail, 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 and finally keep the weight off and achieve our best life in all dimensions. And I'll talk about that more. Now, for those who don't know me, that's who me, that's who I am. I'm a German trained physician and a naturopath. I've trained as a gastrointestinal disease specialist, as an allergologist. 
I've also trained with Dr. Daniel Amen as a certified brain health and mental health professional. And I'm fortunate I'm on his teaching team, so I can teach all of his courses coming up. Just wait for it. And I'm a really passionate health and life coach. And I love people. Now, this is me with my dear hubby, Mike. My second husband, my first, ended up committing suicide, unfortunately. And uh, my current husband and I are together. Next year, it will be 25 years. He's a wonderful person, cranky sometimes, but eh, he's a good person anyway. And uh, the dog on the picture is our dog, Rudy, a Pomeranian, 22 pounds. He thinks he is a husky and he's cute as hell. I'm just training him trying to train his brain to those little buttons. You know, fluent pet doesn't work too good. <clears throat> I guess uh, dogs don't have enough prefrontal cortex. It takes longer. I have to be patient. People too, we have to be patient with ourselves too. All right, let's talk about the three dimensions of brain health. Or as you see, I always look at the five dimension. That's where that little pentagon comes from that I like. Because the three dimensions of brain health are, of course, body, mind, and spirit. They all influence our brain functioning. But I added the social dimension because our relationships are very important. Whether we are able to establish good boundaries with our people around us, have good social relationships, or we constantly clash and we suffer or we are doormats. I was a doormat years ago. I've learned to be more assertive. An interesting word that exists in English, many people don't know in German, it's not existent. You're either submissive or aggressive. Isn't that interesting? Now, then, of course, there is a fifth dimension. I think we need to add the financial dimension because it is not necessarily the fact that everybody has enough money to buy optimal health. And yes, you can buy optimal health, the knowledge, the, the supplements, the food that you really need to really thrive in life. Yes, you can live well on a budget. It's just harder. All right. Now, what are really the so-called diseases of our time? And how do they relate to obesity and weight gain and weight loss? And let's ask a question first. Why do you think that chronic diseases, and I put the, 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 the flash there with the, with the purpose, so we know it's not easing, but it's this ease. It's not feeling good. Why are they increasing? Have you ever thought about it? It's not genetic because our genes do not change within 100 years. There's something else going on. Let's see what they are, those diseases of our civilized world, as we call them often. Now, these are the diseases we are mostly talking about. And last time when I explained the three dimensions of brain health in detail, I actually talked about how I see the slow creeping up of more and more chronic symptom complexes when I talked about the barrel model of disease. And you're lucky because I haven't sent the replay out to everyone yet. So you all will get the replay of that first video with the barrel model of disease that I invented. And I really like the idea. So I think I'll send that out on Sunday I'm planning on. So look at those diseases. In the center, I put leaky gut, inflammation, upset stomach. Because Paracelsus said many, many hundred years ago, all disease starts in the, good, in the gut. Let food be their medicine. And there's a lot of truth in it. And that doesn't mean necessarily a diet. And I'll get to that later. And all those diseases around it hang together in some way. And you might recognize typical fatigue, brain fog. Many people suffer from that. Food allergies, autoimmune diseases. Many people have skin problems, allergies, eczema. In children especially, autism, ADHD is increasing. Memory problems among old people and even younger people. Many people have mental health issues, chronic pain, and of course, obesity. 
it all is a symptom complex. So let's ask what are really the root causes of all those symptom complexes? Now let's see what one of my mentors and neurologist Dale Bredesen said in his famous book, The End of Alzheimer's. I taught about Alzheimer's in Germany. It was well received because you can prevent it to a certain extent. Not all of it, not always. And it is so important. And he identified after 30 years of trying medication, finding a medication, he found actual a system, sorry, that actually works. And he, he identified three main causes of diseases. And what he said, it's either inflammation, it's caused by toxins, it's called by nutrient deficiencies. And of course, each of them have different other root causes behind them that can cause these issues. Now, it's interesting because I get often the question from people that are overweight, I'm overweight, I'm fat. How can I be nutrient deficient? Oh, yes, you can. You know, think about it that way. Your brain has sensors that measure everything that comes and goes into the body and goes out. Now, say in extreme cases, you go on a Twinkie diet. You eat nothing but Twinkies. <laughs> now, they have practically no nutrition, but a lot of calories. So your brain registered, okay, calories are coming in, carbohydrates, fat a little bit, not enough protein, and no micronutrients, no vitamins, no minerals, no phytonutrients. I'm deficient, says the brain. I want to eat more. So it generates hunger, the feeling of hunger and craving for more, 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 more. And if you then only feed it with more Twinkies, well, you are very fast obese. That's one of the root causes of obesity, by the way, that we just don't eat enough food of the right kind. And I'll teach about that later on too. Ah, <laughs> That said, I'm an unwavering optimist. I believe there's always hope, always room for improvement of what is. And there's always a time to heal the person, even if we can't always cure the disease and stop the disease process. Now, I've said that before, but it's something to think about because I firmly believe that healing, which really is the end of our constant suffering, is independent of a cure, whereas the cure defines a complete freedom of disease. That means a terminal cancer patient can be healed as a person, although he's at the end of his life. It sounds counterproductive, but when you think about it deeply, it makes more sense. Now, in practice, there are many, many things we can do to help ourselves, and most of us know what to do. And sometimes the issue is that we just can't bring ourselves to consistently do the things that we want to do. So there will be soon coming up an event also about how to start and cement new healthy habits. Because that is a skill that we all can learn. It's not as hard as it sounds. And there will be practical workshops. I love that. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's get how to train our brain to lose weight fast. It's a big prom promise, but I've done it, and so can you. Number one, water your brain. Let's start right now. I always have on my desk a little mug. And of course, my favorite mug says, life is short, do stuff that matters. That's one of my motto. And I try to stick to it as much as I can. Uh, whatever you drink, drink more, more water, but other calorie free or low calorie liquids count. Broth counts, coffee counts, tea counts, green tea is great for your prefrontal cortex. Uh, kids with ADHD, adults with ADHD tendencies like myself, green tea, best thing very natural way to increase the function of your prefrontal cortex. But broth, or even very diluted natural food juice is okay to hydrate. You don't have to drink pure water and sometimes carbonation can help too. I love my soda spring, one option. 
It depends. But the main thing is get something that you like and make it a habit to have something always ready to drink. When you're working, have a bottle of water or whatever you are, your favorite drink right next to you. When you are eating, when you're doing something, always have your favorite drink and sip all day. I sip water all the day. Everybody that sees me on Zoom knows I always have a cup with something in it. Most of the time it's green tea. Sometimes in the morning it's coffee. Uh, and, and whatever it is, it is great. You need white water because the body is on average about three quarters water. Without water, our brain especially shrivels. We can't think. We make mistakes and we feel sluggish and miserable. So that's why we need water. It's one of the easiest and fastest thing to do for more brain power, for improved mood and memory and overall health. And it makes the kidneys work and eliminate toxins more and the liver and the skin eliminate more toxins. Without water, we die. Now, Water also helps you to burn more calories. You know, when you're dehydrated, you are, blued, you are moody, tired, unfocused, forgetful, maybe have headaches or cravings, and then you eat more. So if you are hydrated, it curbs your appetite. And often you really crave water when you think you want chocolate. Try it. When you have any cravings, first drink a full glass of whatever you want for fluid and then see if you still want what you really are craving for a few minutes before. But be careful, don't drink more than three to four liters, which is about uh, 12 to 16 glasses of water a day, because there is a thing called water intoxication. And that can actually lead to brain swelling and other issues. So the golden zone is in the middle, somewhere between two to four liters, eight to 16 glasses or cups. All righty, number two, move the fat out of your body. Now this lady demonstrates the wrong way to move, <laughs> sitting on the chest of field, watching others do it. That's something we should not delegate. I'm a big fan of delegating work, but not the workouts. <laughs> and on the other hand, I believe movement has to be fun. As everything we should do or want to do for weight loss needs to be fun. Because if we don't enjoy what we're doing, we won't keep it up. So we need to teach the brain to enjoy things. I wrote actually an, a fun blog about uh, how to train your brain to enjoy exercise, even if you hate it with the passion, where I describe how I myself trained my brain to like the gym <laughs> by imagining that I'm going to the beach in the gym, which is the sun. Ah, mm-hmm. And it is a way and seven step process. You can find it on my blog. Just look on the website or send me an email, ask for it. I'll send you the link. Now, I personally am a big fan of not even having to go to the gym because there's always opportunity to move more. For example, I'm teaching this web class. Let's do some exercise right now. I'm sitting. Everybody here that's watching, raise your arms. Ah, I think you're swimming. Looks funny, doesn't it? Doesn't matter. Who cares? Nobody here to laugh. And if they do, I'm with them. And when I walk now, I call that intuitive, intentional movement. That means I walk with the intention of activating and moving as many of my muscles as I can. And that means I'm not just walking. I call it flop, flop, flop. Like most people walk, they mindlessly walk and actually damage their uh, joints and their tendons and their knees and their back. Instead, when you intentionally walk and with intuition, feel your body and your muscles and how the contraction of the muscle, of course, you need to know where they are. If you do that, it's not only much more fun, but it's much more effective because your muscles actually grow and are activated with each walk much, much more as if you just standard walk. 
And when I walk now the dog, <laughs> the neighbors look funny because it looks a little bit like cross country skiing because I engage the arms, I engage the legs, I roll my knees, I go up and down like I'm on a ship. They look at me like I'm weird. And you know what? I'm weird and I'm proud of it. <laughs> now that way you can burn extra calories while building muscle mass. So move as often as you can during the day, even when you need to sit in front of a computer screen at work. <laughs> Aim to get on average at least 30 minutes of moderate activity five times per week. Then you move most areas of your body and you are in a zone where you can just so carry a conversation and talk without being completely out of breath. But even if you do less, modern science has proven that any additional movement will be beneficial for your health. So even when you just watch TV, squeeze your butt cheeks. Hey, nobody notices. Who cares? It's good for your pelvic floor too. <laughs> so if you properly move and as much as possible and really think about every moment of the day, do I move right now? Can I move extra? When you empty the dishwasher, ah, how do you activate it? And I'll, I'll do more videos and teachings around that. It's so much fun when you do it like that. It activates and strengthens your muscles. It also improves your balance. It increases your metabolic baseline and as such burns fat, even when you sleep. And there's other benefits to mindful movement, as you could call that as well. Because research has shown, and we know, that regular movement or exercise reduces stress levels, boosts self-esteem, and improves sleep quality. So you can wake up more refreshed in the morning and start the day with renewed energy and stamina. I call that to sparkle. We learn to sparkle when we do all the things that we need for optimal health. It takes a while. It's a process. All righty. Next. Ah, sleep yourself thin. And remember, I just said how we can increase our baseline, our metabolic baseline, so we even burn more fat when we sleep by activating more muscles, by doing the intentional, intuitive movement as often as we can. Ah, I'm burning calories right now. <laughs> so enough sleep also is very important to regulate weight gain. Now, I do not encourage people to say, oh my God, I have to sleep eight hours or I will not function well. That is a self-defeating belief. Think that way. When you wake up and you can't fall back to sleep, relax and say, hey, the body will take what it needs. My strategy is at night when I wake up and I think the thoughts, I think, what do I have to do tomorrow? I put on an audio book. Very helpful. But one caveat, it has to be something that's interesting enough to distract you from your thoughts, but boring enough so it doesn't hold your attention. So a really exciting audio book will keep you awake. That's not what you want. So for example, I love to listen to at night to the history of the ancient Egyptians. It's interesting enough to keep my attention for a while, but not interesting enough that it keeps me awake. Something like that. You'll find something that's interesting for you, but not so fascinating. It's a very good strategy, believe me. And we know that insomnia has been linked to increased cortisol levels, and that can lead to increased water retention and weight retention in the body. And we'll talk about that too. And it can lead to insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and contribute to type 2 diabetes. And it also can contribute to feeling stressed, tired, and moody, or even depressed. And we'll talk about that more. And in one of the follow-up emails, I'll send you my tip sheet with the 10 sleep hacks and the 10 stress busters. So make sure that you eat right, move regularly, and go to bed at a good time so that you give your body the opportunity to rest for seven to eight hours. Whether you sleep or not doesn't matter. Never forget the body takes what it needs. The more you stress out to try to fall asleep, the less it will work. And 
I always recommend not to sleep in on the on the weekend to make up for the deficit during the week. Get up at the same time every day if you can. Uh, that's why nurses, for example, that have to work shift work or other shift workers have a much harder time uh, to keep the weight off and have other health issues too. Now, of course, we all know, keep your bedroom cool and dark and as quiet as possible. And even if you just do these three things combined, it will help you to lose weight faster than anything else. Now, eating the right foods before bed can also help you to sleep better. A little hint, a little bit of carbohydrates plus a bit of the right protein works best. And the relationship has to be about one to seven, so seven uh, type calories in carbs and one uh, calorie in protein. For example, a small piece of pizza. That way it will increase the levels of serotonin and other sleep hormones in the brain, calm you down and prepare you for sleep. The same if you have a shower in the evening, don't finish up cold. If you have a shower in the morning, do finish up cold. And I'll explain that a little more when we get to the cortisol. So how do you know which foods will give you the most energy without making you feel sluggish on awakening? Well, a potent strategy that I do in all my courses and programs is a sleep, food, mood, poop journal. And that will help you to figure it out. That means track your own reactions. It's individually different and make yourself a project. That's the best way for pretty much everything that's related to change. <laughs> now, it sounds counterproductive, but I'm a big fan of fat. I always say eat more fat. <laughs> I love jokes. So those poor little avocado with the, with the, Pat belly, I said, you're the good kind of fat. <laughs> I don't think he's really happy about it. So we all know by now that if you want to lose weight, it's important to eat less added sugar. Now, that's another issue. Sugar cravings are a real issue. Sugar addiction is a real issue. There's experiments with mice. When they have the choice between sugar water and heroin, the mice choose sugar water. All right, it's really addictive. Sugar addiction can be overcome. It's not that easy. It takes about a week and you will have withdrawal symptoms. For example, in January, I have a free challenge where we will overcome any sugar cravings. Now, I am a big fan of a cravings type questionnaire that I administer in my programs and choosing the proper supplements. And I've seen it very often. If you take the right supplement, usually an amino acid, uh, under the tongue, when you have a craving, it disappears within 15 to 30 seconds. It is amazing to see that. Oof, avoiding most added sugars will help you to avoid most cravings in the long run. And it will also eliminate the afternoon slump and give you energy throughout the day. So I'm not against sugars if they are naturally and in the natural food. So fruit usually has fiber with it. And if you eat uh, a little bit added sugar, sometimes it's not a big deal, especially if you have fat with it. But if you really eat a lot of candy, you will have a problem. Now, most of us should really eat more fat because most of us eat too little good fat. When you consider that the dry mass of our brain is 60% fat, our brain craves fat. And we know, for example, that people that have too low cholesterol, sometimes cholesterol pills are overdosed and the cholesterol goes too low, they have a higher risk for dementia because the brain is starved of the good fats. So the right type and the amount of fat are very important. And you might have heard of the omega-3 index and the imbalance of omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. And I actually had the inventor or the co-inventor of the omega-3 index, Dr. Bill Harris, on one of my shows, podcasts and video shows, and it's on my website. It's a really good blog about it. And I'll be happy to send it to you too in one of the follow-up. Uh, emails. It's it's really good. And he talks about brain health and omega-3s and uh, very good resources. 
and uh, he, he researched bats for I think 30 or 40 years and he's in 70 now and, and we have a lot of fun on that interview. <laughs> so what are healthy fats? Now think avocados, that's a funny, uh, the good kind of fat, but it's not just avocados, nuts, although the omega sixes are natural omega six, seeds, fatty fish like salmon, even if it's farmed salmon, ranched, as Bill Harris said, we talk about that. Herring, excellent, small cold water fish, mackerel, sardines, so good to get your omega-3s. Healthy animal fats, what's healthy animal fat? Fat from animals that have been raised in their natural environment. For example, cows that are traditionally fed with grains and cow food have an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 20 to 1. Grass-fed animal cow fat has, an, has a ratio of 3 to 1, which is the regular ratio. Big, big difference how the animals are raised. I wrote a little booklet, Eating for Vibrant Health and Explosive Energy. Ask me for it. Uh, I'll give, it's on Amazon, but you can uh, get it for free as a PDF on my website. So all those good fats, including extra virgin olive oil, of course, will keep you full longer, make you feel satisfied and contribute to eating less overall and losing weight in the long run while feeling great because your brain is properly nurtured. Now, sometimes we need supplements because it's just impossible to get enough omega-3s on a diet and who can afford all that good food all the time? Most people can't. I don't even can do it because probably I don't charge enough for my programs, could be whatever. Oh yes, that's well known. Mind your weight, mindfully intuitive eating, of course. I talk about intentional and intuitive eating, which is similar. And we talk a lot about mindfulness, but we really don't need to go to a yoga studio or a separate mindfulness class. And ideally, mindfulness is a way of life. If you're a little older, like I am, I'm 61, you may remember the famous book by Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, where he talks about that. And if you're raised in a Christian tradition and know the Bible, like me, you may remember that Paulus talks in the New Testament about pray without cessation. There you have it. That's mindfulness. So when it comes to eating, mindfulness is really a way of being aware of your thoughts and feelings about food and eating without judgment. That's hard to implement in everyday life. It took me a long while, believe me. I always felt guilty when I ate something I shouldn't have eaten. See, along the thought, I shouldn't eat that is bad for your brain because it makes you feel bad, right? So, of course, the general rule, sit down, slowly chew savor your food and we'll do a video we'll do a workshop about mindful eating and intentional and intuitive eating because it's so much fun i once ate a raisin it took me five minutes before i actually swallowed it <clears throat> it's possible so it's also mindfulness and paying attention to what you're doing that's the same thing paying attention to what you're doing in the moment in the moment i'm raising my arm and down that's paying attention it helps you to be more present in the moment and when you are thinking about food you will notice it and you will notice when you're eating too much and when you're full so you will stop earlier and you will notice when you're feeling stressed and that's why you want to eat so that's a process that you can learn. And in my courses, I give worksheets out to help people realize what they are thinking and how to change it. Because if you're aware of what you're thinking in the moment, it can help you to make better choices and eat healthier. Because training your brain is all about making better choices and developing better habits and lifestyle choices. And it's changing your brain that will do that. <clears throat> And I, I happen to call it intentional and intuitive eating because you have the intention of eating food that's good for you and your intuition tells you, is that food something that you like, that you maybe love, 
is that a food that will love you back, that you actually feel good afterwards, after you ate it? Is it, are you satisfied? Is your intuition telling you, your body, your feelings telling you? I want you to pay attention to all those feelings. And when you eat that way, it helps you to lose weight because it helps you to focus or direct your intention on eating healthy food and even exercising regularly. And while using your intuition to know when you are hungry, really hungry, and you're really feeling down or sad or stressed or angry, and when to stop eating. And it can help you to cope better with stress and anxiety too. Because you know, your brain always tries to get you more of the things you focus on. I made a little fun video, how your brain is like your car. Remember, if you drive in, in driving school, you were probably taught when you drive to look what's in front of you, to focus on what's in front of you on the road. And why is that? Because your brain, what you focus on, it takes you there. When you're sitting at the steering wheel of a car, and you focus on the road in front of you, you will go right there. When you focus on the obstacle, you will hit it. And it's the same in your life, when you're at the helm of your life. When you focus on a clearly defined goal, now that's another thing that I teach in my course, is how to get goals, and I teach about that online too. When you have a clear goal, and it's not just losing weight, because there's a reason why you want to lose weight, and it's not just to be thin. There's something you want to do when you're thin. Maybe getting married or maybe looking good on the pictures. That's okay. Or maybe you want to be getting old and staying healthy and seeing your grandchildren grow up. By the way, I have six of them. It's a pleasure sometimes. They're not local, but still WhatsApp is better than nothing. And you have to have a good reason why you want to be alive, why you want to be healthy, and why you want to lose the weight for good and keep it off. Because if it's just to prepare for an event, to prepare for a vacation, to look good in a bikini, that's okay for a moment. But what about once you got married, once the vacation is over? What keeps you from packing all those pounds back on? Something to think about. So this way of mindful eating in the long run teaches you how to control your eating habits. So it helps you to lose fat and build muscle by training your brain to focus on positive eating habits and movement and other lifestyle and habits and routines. And over time, you will learn how to control your emotions and thoughts. And then you will feel better about you and your body. Ah, surround yourself with healthy whole foods to avoid carb cravings. And we talked about that before. I won't lose too much time with that. Healthy whole foods are very important. The less processed a food is, the better it is. Now there's natural ways of food processing. And I explain all that in my little booklet, Vibrant Eating for Vibrant Health and Explosive Energy. Yeah, let me show it off. It's a fun little book. Uh, and I, I, I really tell them, talk about the different food groups and what's ideal to eat, what's acceptable and what better to avoid in a very practical way. I wrote that for my clients. There's a few of my favorite recipes in it that are easy to do, like sprouts or stuff like that. And whole foods, ideally, and I say ideally, in season, local, organic or biodynamically grown, then they provide the vitamins, minerals, fiber, proteins, and good fats that you need to keep your body and its complex metabolism and biochemistry running smoothly. Now, sometimes we don't have access to those foods. For example, I live in Nova Scotia. Here in the winter, we really don't get much nutritious food. So I chose to take supplements. And uh, I have a supplement regimen, and I create that for my clients too, a, a targeted, I call it a nutrition and the supplement symphony because it has to fit somebody that eats a lot of processed food needs different different supplements or with health conditions or genetic conditions need different supplements than somebody that has no problems and eats all organic foods so processed foods 
why are they bad? Number one, they are often devoid of nutrients. And to, to two, they often contain chemicals and environmental toxins that make us crave more food and that get often enriched in fatty tissues like the brain and the fat. So if we then lose weight without supporting our detoxification organs, we get an overload of toxins, feel miserable, and then start eating again. So that way eating processed food can stop you from losing weight. And eating real food will give you energy throughout the day instead of feeling tired after eating. All right, let's talk about cortisol and stress. We all are stressed nowadays. Why is that? Why are you stressed really? Sometimes we stress ourselves when we exercise at physical stress, but most often there's psychological stress. We put ourselves under pressure. We want to be the best wife. We want to do it right. Um, we maybe are in conflict constantly with our value system, or we are in a relationship that is not really what we want. And that conflict con is a constant stress. And of course, the distractions. we in the computer. There pops a reminder up. There's a notification. And of course, we have to look at our phone, check it constantly. We don't have no quiet moment anymore. And our brain, our body is not made for that. We are made for an environment 10,000 years ago where we lived in caves. And yes, there was stress when we were out to hunt and we encountered an animal that wanted to eat us. So it was fight or flight or freeze. So that was stress, very stressful, but only for a moment. And that's okay, because afterwards the body could go back to the baseline. It's called homeostasis, balance. The body balances itself. But if you have constantly stressed, you come home, go on the computer, you watch TV, watch a horror movie, get stressed out again, uh, fight with your husband or loved one or kids or whatever, you get stressed out even more. And that leads to your cortisol level being chronically elevated. Now you need to know one thing about cortisol. Cortisol is essential for health. We need cortisol to live. We are dead if we don't have cortisol. But normally it is tightly, like many hormones and systems in our body, it's tied to what's called the circadian rhythm. That's a rhythm of about 24 hours a duration that is tied to light. And uh, many shift workers experience big problems because it is disrupted. But say you're not a shift worker, then normally morning when you get up out of bed, your cortisol levels are very high, which is great because it gives you energy for the day. You want it high. And then during the day, the cortisol level normally goes down unless you stress yourself out. That's, by the way, the reason why they recommend that you do not do strenuous exercise late in the day. It raises your cortisol and stresses at a time when we don't want to do that because we need lower cortisol in the evening to prepare for sleep. All those hormones go together. The whole body is a very complex system. And I'm in awe every time I teach about it, I think about it, I look at my body, I say, wow, what a miraculous thing that it is. It's a miracle. It's magic that it works. It's so much more than just a machine or a conglomeration of system. It's a whole person. It's a living thing that regulates itself. It's a miracle. Wow. So that said, we need the circadian rhythm. It's part of our homeostatic system part of the balance of the system, and it helps to regulate our weight. We often say cortisol is a devil, and it's not true. It's a totally, constantly elevated cortisol, and that can increase your insulin resistance, can lead to metabolic system, type 2 diabetes, and to constantly high sugar levels. And that has to be, of course, addressed. And how can we address all those negative thoughts that we constantly think? Now, I like to have fun. I'm a constantly having fun. Look at that beautiful ant eater. Now, how do I get that ant eater? 
Now, I'm with Dr. Daniel Amen. I'm on his teaching team, and he coined the term ants after an ant infestation in his kitchen. When he was cleaning up the ant, it came to him. Oh, no, my patients have ants in their brain. Automatic negative thoughts is an acronym. And I love that much more than saying CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. How boring is that? No, we have ants that infest our brain. And we need learn to learn to become an ant eater. I love that. Exterminate the ants in our brain. It's so much fun. I'll teach a class about that too. So with that thought change method with the ant eater, we can learn to control our thoughts and change our thoughts from bad ones that tell us I'll never able to lose that weight. I failed so often, I'll fail again. We can learn to change that, to train our brain to change those thoughts to more helpful thoughts that are realistic and we believe. And why do often positive affirmation chain fail? Well, if you say to yourself, I'm thin, be positive, I'm thin. But you look in the mirror and you look at yourself and you're fat. Well, your brain says you're full of shit. You don't believe it. Right? So you have to uh, change your belief, I'm fat and ugly, that often obese people have. I thought of myself as fat and ugly when I was 325 pounds. I thought I was absolutely horrible looking. Thankfully, my husband loved me anyway. But he too thought I wasn't looking very well. But hey, whatever. So when you then say to yourself, OK, my current looks not what I really want, but if I cons consistently work on losing the weight, I can change my looks to something that I like better. That sounds much more positive to your brain and actually motivates you to keep those changes up because you have that beautiful body in your mind that you know you can get to. But if you tell yourself, oh, I am thin, you won't believe it and it's uh, meaningless. So it's important instead of thinking how miserable you feel now, change your thoughts to think more about how much better you will feel when you reach your goal. And then you can start to believe that you can do anything if you put your mind to it, step by step in small increments. The same way we can train our brain to stop seeing food as just fuel or essential or something that's like a sedative or an anti-anxiety or antidepressant, and instead viewing it as a pleasure, especially as a sensory pleasure, a little bit like food porn, you know, sex. Hmm. And that will actually help you make healthier choices. You know, if you think about you love the foods that love you back, so I have my clients make a list of the foods they love, and then we pick the foods that love them back, and that's the foods they'll eat more. And so it's a win-win. I love those foods, but the foods also love me back. Now, what could be better? It's like a relationship. You don't want a husband that you love and he doesn't love you, or a wife that loves you and you don't love her. So the same with food. And of course, it's important not to use food to fill up empty spaces in your life, but to use it to enhance life experiences. And I know I used to eat because I just felt empty inside. So I filled myself with food. And many times, especially women, they pack on the pounds after they had been sexually abused as children. That's very common. I had that experience myself. And that leads to a very miserable kind of obesity that is hard to break unless you heal the trauma that is at the bottom. And you can do that. One of the techniques I use to do that is called havening techniques. I teach that. Now, one of the best ways to practice change is, of course, journaling. And I love gratitude journals. I give one away on my website. I wrote one. It's on Amazon too. Here, yeah, my daily sparkle of gratitude. I love reading books. And 
uh, but I also love giving them away for free, so, at least the PDF version, so everybody can benefit from them. It's different because it has quotes and thinking prompts. It's not just three things to be grateful for, but it teaches you actually how to be grateful. And it can be a great way to increase the appreciation to yourself for your environment and your food. And it's really made to help you to think in new and more helpful ways. All right, now the last point that I always talk about is support. One of my favorite teachers, uh, uh, executive coach Marshall Goldsmith. He taught people, uh, he, he coached people like CEOs of Coca Cola or people like that with high up there. He always said, We all need help. We all need help. For me, it was the hardest thing to ask for help when I was depressed and suicidal. I had to go to the emergency room and ask for help, or I would have died. I would have killed myself. It was hard. And I realized at the point, we all need help, we do. So the best way to lose weight, and I hope you're not at the point that you are that bad, but if you are, let me know and I can talk to you. I know a little bit about it. So the best way to lose weight fast and make it last is to get support. So the first place to look for support is of course, friends and family. Do they encourage you to stick to your diet plan and exercise? that you set yourself. Don't let anybody else push you into something that you don't want to do. Or are your friends and family make fun of you or make discouraging remarks like my dear husband, he said, oh, you won't keep that up. Yeah, yeah, you do that now, but in two weeks it's gone. <laughs> Very encouraging, is it? It takes a lot of effort to push through that and you need support. And if your husband or family is not supportive like that, you might hire somebody to help you with the support. Uh, a gym can help. Sometimes there's very good fitness trainers there that uh, and other like-minded people that want to lose weight. A support group on the Facebook can help. Sometimes you meet people that you actually can meet. I mean, not just chat. There's a big difference between meeting somebody, talking to somebody, and just chatting with somebody. And because lasting weight loss needs lasting changes and they are not easy to do changes need effort at the start and you to build lasting habits you have to have a strategy and a method in place and our brain plays a really huge role in our ability to lose weight it controls everything from hunger to metabolism so it's important to train your brain and sometimes you're more successful and sometimes you fall back down in the dumps and then you eat something that you maybe didn't want to do. Well, next time, start over. Do it like a little baby. Treat yourself just like you would a toddler. When a toddler tries to walk and falls down, you don't say to it, oh, you stupid little brat, you will never learn to walk. Look, you fell again. Now you encourage him and say, hey, look, you did it. Do it again. Same thing, when you fall off the weight loss bandwagon, get back up, gentle with yourself, be encouraging. And if you need some more support, I always invite everybody that wants to, to experience, I call it the magic of great coaching. I offer a free coaching session to help people through their weight loss uh, plateau and uh, it helps. In the end, everything is about achieving balance in all areas of your life. Balancing your lifestyle, your work, relaxation, stress, mood, food, movement, mindset, and the support system, and having a clear purpose and meaning for your life. All that will help you, not just to lose the excess pounds, but overall to feel happier and more fulfilled. Now, as you know, the holidays are coming up. And it can be stressful for some people. So <laughs> don't do like this Santa and, and burn out. Pace yourself. Enjoy the ride. If you are with friends and family, enjoy those. If not, look for a support group. There are lots of them. I know some people are really depressed around the holiday season when they don't have family and friends. 
and, and those need extra support. Now what's coming up uh, in the next few weeks, I just want to quickly go through it. Next week, I'll teach about the four pillars of lasting brain-driven weight loss, which is mindset, eating, movement, support, of course. And then I'll talk about the weight-gut-brain connection more in detail, and the metabolic switch. <laughs> I love the metabolic switch. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and then I'll start teaching something that I really like to teach. Those are structures and functions of our digestive system. So we really understand what's going on in our belly. It's actually a 10 part series because I want you to understand what happens in your mouth when you chew, what muscles are there, where does the food go? So you can visualize the food going down. It it gives you a whole new understanding. And I teach it in layman's terms because I like to speak in simple stuff. Yes, I understand all that fancy uh, medical English, but it's not needed. So the easiest way to not miss out on upcoming free events is to check in with my emails, of course. And maybe you can follow me on Eventbrite uh, so you get notified when I post a new event. So that's it for today. We are coming to the end. And again, if you want to book one of my magic weight loss breakthrough sessions, feel free to type this URL in your browser and see if there's still something available. And I'll be happy to talk with you in person and help you to devise a strategy to break through your plateaus. Thank you again for listening to me and I hope to see you next time.